What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. That enables us to keep coming to y'all as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please hit that subscribe button, like our content, share, talk about it, be about it, each one, teach one, and we appreciate your support in getting us this far. Now, today, we have the honor and privilege of being joined by Joseph Abajian, DJ Jab, for those who know him that way, the owner, founder, and man of many accomplishments from Fat Beats. Thank you for coming through, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely an honor and privilege. Uh, been to your stores on different coasts, different locations, and uh, excited to highlight a lot of your accomplishments here. And one thing that I remember I had read a long time ago, so I hope this is right, but that uh, you, a business class you had taken kind of inspired you or gave you the thought or idea, a business class you were taking in college gave you the idea to start Fat Beats? Is that, uh, is that, is my memory serve me correctly here? Um, well, I, I took business. I did, you know, I, I went, joined the army after high school. And then after the army, I did um, go to college for business. Um, when I first initially went, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So it wasn't, um, it was things, other things that happened in New York that, that sort of led me to a record store, you know, that direction. And what were those things? Um, <laughs> pretty simple. No hip hop record stores or rap record stores in New York City. You know, you're talking about 1991 and 92. And as a DJ and anyone who lived in New York knew you had to go to maybe five or six different record stores to, you know, to get your hip hop. And um, it just didn't make any sense, especially being New York City, you know, the, the Mecca and the Bronx, one of the boroughs where it all started. And um, and I have to say, 91, 92, you know, hip hop. Um, was going through some sort of discovery changes styles were changing and house music kind of was dominating and dance music was was really um taken off but you know there was still that that, that hip-hop element and it just didn't make sense that in new york city you can't buy hip-hop records and anyone who knew it, they always had like a small hip-hop section in the back or somewhere and um it just was strange because you know you're paying you're a paying customer and but you have no, no one to supply you so, um, you know, I was in college and I wanted to start a business and that's where it kind of clicked. I mean, it really clicked when I would go to a record store and um, just get bad service. You know, um, New York was was tripping out a little bit in those days, 93, 92, 94. You know, if you wore baggy clothes, if you dressed a certain way, you know, they didn't treat you that, you know, treat you that, that, that respectful, kind of gave you a little hard time, especially um, on the retail front. And that's, that also clicked. And I was like, you know, it's because you dress, you know, in a hip hop fashion. Uh, I'm a B-boy. So if you dress like a B-boy, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're there to rob someone. Um, so it all just kind of came together at the right time, you know, in, in, in yeah, 1994. These type of things. And uh, I would only have been going to New York a couple of times at that point in my life because I'm from Maryland. But the thing that amazes me about this time in New York is that given the music was so big that New York itself where the majority of the labels were, a lot of the artists were, and it was so big that New York's, the city itself still had a stiff arm <laughs> to rap. It was just, it just always blows me away. And, and I actually yeah. saw it myself coming into New York because I was always like, oh man, it's going to be everywhere. And it wasn't. And it just always blew me away. I just couldn't believe it. No, yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, a good example, like in the in the movie Beach Street, when they're in the subway stations battling, the cops came. Well, they just arrested everyone. You know, and that was the general concept. You know, and it's like, so when you, it was just strange because you felt that sort of pressure on you. You know, everywhere you went, and you're just like. You know, it's just it ain't, you know, you, you, so so you wonder like hip hop, a lot of people that were into rap had that sort of, you know, that angry kind of or, or the, you know, that sort of, um, you know, they would carry themselves a little like, hey, you know, don't mess with me, you know, because of the way the pressures of New York would come down on you. And I always felt it, too. And it, about New York City at that in those days, it really was it was it was how you dressed. 
you know, it, how, it sort of stereotyped you. Um, so when I was seeing that, I was like, man, what if, what if I opened up a, 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 a hip hop store, you know, obviously we predominantly rap because music sells more than anything. And, and I treated the people that look like me with, with respect and, 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 you know, open, open the doors for them. And that's what I did. And they, you know, gave it right back. So, yeah, it definitely worked. But that yeah. being that being said, in 90, 94, when you launched uh, the first store, what made that the right time, the right opportunity, the right location, all that? What made that crystallize to be like, this is the place, this is the time, this is now? Well, hip hop, I mean, vinyl itself, the labels were trying to cut vinyl out. But anyone that was in 1994, they were just trying to eliminate vinyl. So you know, I saw that as like, you know, why, why are you guys doing that? And then obviously I caught on to the whole CD sort of explosion. You know, Sony was the main company behind it at the time because Sony had a big market share in CD, CD players. So they, they cut out their vinyl and the other labels started doing vinyl just for promo reasons and stuff because everyone was trying to push CDs. Remember the CDs back then were those big cases. They tried to make it look big, even though it was a little tiny CD. And the cost of CDs, you know, were a fraction to vinyl. So the labels didn't really look at the people and what, what the environment, you know, what everyone wanted. They just looked at, oh, these, these are a lot cheaper to make, a lot, lot quicker. And, you know, and if you have like a kind of a cheap stereo system, you know, CD players, CDs will sound better than a record but they didn't realize what was going on in New York. In, in the ni- early 90s, New York was on a whole retro thing, um, not just for, for rap and hip hop, but um, the, the city in general, everybody was dressing, wearing bell bottoms again, and had the big platforms and the big glasses and, and, the, and the average person was buying vinyl. So when I saw when the labels were, because before I opened, I went, I went around to all the labels, talk, tell them I'm trying to open up a record store, they were laughing at me like vinyl record store. I don't want to be buying, buying vinyl anymore. So they're predicting CDs. But I knew, you know, the DJ scene. I'm like, man, there, there's so many DJs that I know, you know, that 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 spin vinyl and this and that. So I sort of took a chance, but I I, I thought I wasn't because I'm like, there's a big void, you know, in in the, in the most grand city in the whole world, and I'm going to fill that void, you know, and try to open up a record store. So. It, the timing was just because when I finished college, it wasn't, you know, that's just because I was out of college and um, I had, a, you know, I had a good job, but I was like, if I'm going to start a business, it's, it's to do it now in case things don't work out. And I'll still be, you know, well under 30 and I can do whatever I'm going to do with my life. So timing was just because I finished college and I was like, hey, you know, let me try to do this now while I have the energy and I'm young. And New York still was um, very artistic in those days. It was, it wasn't, uh, sort of the commercial brand city that it is now it was a very artistic city. So I thought it would work. And I mean, it did. Yeah. And speaking of the art on a lot of the, the fat beat stores I've been to and have seen the pictures of and all that graffiti stuff on the walls is, was an integral part of the aesthetic and the feel and the vibe of it. So why was that something that you encouraged and embraced? Well, growing up, you know, on the East coast, most of, mostly in New York, spent like uh, nine years in Connecticut also. Um, in the early 80s, like the hip hop art for me and mostly everyone was was b-boying and breaking. So b-boying was my thing. And then b-boying, you know, you just naturally get into graffiti. So we were doing a lot of graffiti, a lot of b-boying. And um, the DJing didn't come until 85 is when I started DJing. But up until then, that was the art for me. So like I used to, you know, I used to go out bombing. I got my, 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 uh, my black books and tagging and, you know, doing aerosol art, going out there with the cans and stuff. And it was just, it's, it's just what we did. So we were doing a, a lot of graffiti. Um, we'd be break dancing almost every day. I'm just too, you know, I'm almost six one. So it's hard to, you know, to, you know, to pursue that. So um, when the, when the store opened up, that's just the look that I, that I knew, you know, and um, hip hop was very colorful. 
And, you know, I, I love graffiti. I mean, graffiti, even, even till today, I, I, you know, I go, I check out graffiti all the time and the advancements in it. And, um, you know, I just wanted to, um, I mean, it's just not what I wanted. It's just, it's the art that I like. So before I um, opened the store, we put all the pegboards up that would, hold, that would hold the racks for the records. But before we did that, I had graffiti artists come in and graffiti up all the walls. So when you first, first came in the Fat Beats, when we first, first opened, there was no records. So when you came in the store, all the walls were graffiti. And um, that just kind of became um, sort of the look because it took, yeah, it took a few weeks, I don't know, maybe a month or two before I was able to fill up all the walls. So in the meantime, you know, you had records, but then you had graffiti art. And I think that added to, especially anyone that was into hip hop, when they came in, they were like, oh, okay, this is where I need to be. Cause it's not, it's not a record store. It's a hip hop store that sells records. Right. And to that point, how did you, having never owned or operated a record store before, what was it like before you actually opened and launched? How, what was your process of learning how running a record store worked? Well, I learned from my, my prior job. I worked in corporate real estate. And um, when I went to college, I just happened to be good with, uh, with books, bookkeeping and accounting. So I went to college, I went for, um, I went for accounting at first, and then I switched to business or business management. I switched to business administration. So I knew how to do accounting and tables and run numbers. When I started working, I became the bookkeeper at the job I was at. So I was actually doing, um, at the time I was doing accounts payable. And I was doing accounts receivable, sorry. I was accounts receivable, collecting all the funds. So I worked in the bookkeeping department. The woman next to me, she was doing accounts payable. So I was learning how the business ran because I had that question too. I was like, how does the business run? Like, how do you, you know, you come in, open the doors? How does, how does things happen? So uh, my boss at the time was just very open and friendly and he was telling me things. And I just learned how the business ran and how to uh, make it official. And just having the bookkeeping background, um, I just tracked everything. I still do to this day. So tracking was very important, knowing what's coming in, what the profit margins are, turnaround time, how we sell things. It just happened to be, I, I opened up a week before the Rocksteady reunion and it was the last Superman battle. And everybody into like the art of hip hop what came to New York that year it was 94 um, July. And I just was in, a, you know, at a, it was a good time in a good place. You know, um, I mean, going back to your question is just that everything sold right away. So it kind of helped with the books. You know, when you sell everything, it's just a little easier to, to manage things. Yeah. And speaking of that, I heard, or I remember also reading back in the day too, that you had sold out everything in like two or three days. So, you know, I don't know how much that was, but even if you had only had 30 pieces of vinyl to sell, everything is a, a big accomplishment. So what, what did that show you teach you? Did you understand after running through all your inventory so quickly? Um, well that, you know, that people like this, like the, like the music, you know, that wasn't just me. Because um, it, it's not, uh, you know, it, I'm not sure how everyone else does their business. I'm sure everyone has a passion for it the same way. But I was selling stuff that I liked. Like this, this was good music. Like the records that I was ordering were stuff that I, was, I heard on the radio. And um, I was looking for them on vinyl. A lot of them were B-sides. And I had to learn that, learn that game real quick because the A-sides usually had the, the bigger commercial record. But the stuff that... The radio stations I was listening to was playing the B sides and uh, more of the the harder hip hop stuff. So yeah, just flipping all the records that first week. It was it was it was the first week actually, because um, I opened like I like I said I opened up during the new music seminar, and there was a Superman battle and there was the DJ battle too, um, and um, there was also Rocksteady reunion. So like everybody was in New York. And right before I opened, I promoted the store the best I could. I, I had made stickers. I, I, would, I would say I was probably one of the earlier brands that was going around New York with, you know, putting their stickers up everywhere. And um, the stickers really helped 
the train logo that we had, which represents the last stop for hip hop, was more, you know, people was catching on to it and they were like, what, what does this mean? What is that? And they would come down to the store. And when it first came down, as you can imagine, when you walk in, it's all the graffiti. I'm usually there cutting it up or something or somebody, you know, so it was like a sort of a um, experience for people to come in and be like, oh, okay. And um, I felt it became like a safe haven, you know, for people that wanted to experience true New York you know, or true essential hip hop, because I keep saying New York, but this was going on all around the world. You know, I just happened to be, you know, in, in the in the place where it started at. And we just, yes. yeah, just, it, it just happened to, um, sort of um the people that came in just just you know vibe with it it was like this is you know this is the kind of stuff i like and people would hang around the store sometimes for hours you know because um just what was going on and at what point uh in the progression of the business did fat beach start selling albums because i know a lot of the business was at least initially was 12 inch but what when when and why did you start carrying albums Oh, we always, you know, 12 inches was what drove the DJs, you know, so, and DJs were on a hunt. There was so many DJs, you know, um, in the metropolitan area, also in New England, you know, New Jersey, coming out from the island. And um, so 12 inches were the way because they had instrumentals, a lot of them had remixes and stuff that you couldn't, you know, you you couldn't find on the album. Um, We still carried albums too, you know, definitely carried as many albums as I could. It's just 12 inches were so much cheaper you can get three 12 inches for the price of one album. So it was just a a matter of budget. So the first, first few orders I did remember everything. Now I'm a brand new business and um, the distributors trying to think the one stops, they took credit card, no one took credit cards. So I had, I literally had to pay cash and it was, there was no, there was no credit. It was, you know, you know, who's this crazy looking dude trying to buy records. We're not giving you any credit right now. You got to pay for it up front. So if you came into the first first stores, yeah, you probably saw more twelve inches only because the, because of the budget wise, you know, because you make more on albums too eventually. Right. But, um, yeah, budget wise was I just had to split it up, and uh, also they don't want to have just one one genre. So we had you know we had a lot of rap twelve inches rap albums. We also had some R and B and reggae, and I was trying to stay up on the break beats. Um, so always had those all those different sort of styles in the store just at the beginning it was just limited and it was just as things started flipping the sections would get bigger you to listen real close to me. I'm going to ask you some real simple questions. and I want some real simple answers. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you understand? Yes, I, I understand. You said that you couldn't have possibly been at the crime scene at 1115 because you were in the bookstore buying my audio book and my hardcover book at 11.15 when the crime scene occurred in Soren's book. The history of gangster rap. So you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying the books. Right, right. At 11.15, I was I was at the bookstore at, at 11.15 and when, when I, bought, I bought the books and accidentally left them at the store. So at 11.15, you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying books, right? At, at eleven fifteen, I was. We we was when I was leaving. It was, it was some people coming in, and I I, I forgot to grab. But you, you you don't remember who what they look people, like. What they look like or nothing, right? No. Hmm. So. Twelve fifteen. 
He went to a bookstore buying my audio book and hardcover book and Soren's book at 1215. So you couldn't have been at the scene because you were buying the books, right? Yeah, at 12, exactly. At 12, at 1215, exactly, I was at the bookstore. <laughs> Now you see. You know you're not fucked up. Which, which no, one? First you said you were at the bookstore at 11.15 and then you said you were at 12.15. You know you're not fucked up. He fucked up. Yeah, he fucked up. He fucked up. Man, you con you're confusing me, man. So, you get my book, my audio book, 40 years, and Soren's book, History of Gangster Rap, and if you don't, you know you're not fucked up, right? Man, the more those cops ask me questions, the more I wish I bought them motherfucking books. <laughs>